Okay, so we are, what we're going to do today, we're going through Acts 2, and it's just a little passage. It's not a super big story or anything. It's kind of just like a descriptor. And so what I want to do today, I kind of sent this out on an email, is we kind of want to do like a little detective thing today. We want to kind of do like, have you guys ever seen the TV show CSI? You guys know about that show? CSI, the CSI Miami, Las Vegas, there's all these different, these different things, right? So how does, how does this show typically work out? Uh, this is how it, it typically happens. I don't know if it shows us on the show, but the police show up, they get a call, they quarantine the area, they put the, the crime tape everywhere, and then eventually the detectives show up, right? When the detectives show up and there's a bunch of clues ready to go and the smart people go to work. They start looking at all the things in the scenes, or sorry, on the crime scene. They're putting things together and they start to follow leads. And eventually they put it all together and they find out who this person is who committed the crime and we're all baffled and we've been following them the whole way through. And so this is called an inductive investigation where you put all the clues together and then you put a conclusion together at the end and you say, well, this is how it all happened. And today we want to look at this amazing church uh, that's in Acts chapter 2. And we want to kind of do the same thing. We want to investigate it and we want to kind of climb under the police tape and everything is kind of on pause. And we want to kind of look at why it is this way. How did it become this way? And what does God have for our church at ABC this year? And so I think that there's a lot of what's going on in this passage is repeatable, but we need to understand and follow into Jesus's way for our church to be able to do this. And so what we're going to do is we're going to kind of look at the crime scene right now. I want to kind of describe if we like kind of walked into the crime scene, what is going on. I want to kind of explain verses 42 to 47. And then I want to kind of look at other leads, maybe outside. We're going to call a friend kind of thing and figure this out outside of the passage and put it all together and try to understand what does this mean for us? How do we start on this journey to becoming like this? This is a beautiful type of church that we see here. This is the type of church that verse 47 in the end, uh, people in the world are attracted to this and they want to they want to be a part of this because they have a fear of missing out because they're seeing something so powerful here. So let's do it. Uh, in verse 2, verse 42, I'm going to read the verses and to kind of explain them. And I wanted you to see that there's kind of a logical sequence going on here. So in verse 42, it says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And, and so the first thing we have to know is this, this word, it says that they devoted themselves. And in the Greek, that word means that they, they um, persisted or they persevered or they continued on. There was this intentionality to continue to do what they had already been doing. So they're not, they're not making up what they want to do. They see something and they're following it and they're con- they don't want to lose this, something about their community. There's something central to what Jesus was doing when he was on earth and they don't want to lose that because if they lose that, there's some of the magic is going to disappear that, that he brought in. And so there's like teaching. Jesus did a lot of teaching. There's this close community. There's this encouraging. There's eating together. Jesus ate a lot. And then in the New Testament, in the Gospels, he's always eating with people. And he, say, he seems to think that's a really cool thing. And he prays with them. He, he teaches them to pray. And together they pray with each other. And, and so this is the first thing that we see is that the, the, the disciples are saying we can't lose the life of Jesus, the way of Jesus. We can't just invent something new. And this leads to verse 43. In verse 30, 43, it says, Everyone was filled with awe at the wonders and signs performed by the apostles. And if you have a different translation than the NIV, it might say everyone was filled with fear. And that word awe or fear is how we get the word phobia from. What do you guys think is going on there? It says they were all filled with fear. This is, I think that there's this, this sense where the church is, is coming under this great wonder and this great awe of God himself. God is present in their midst. There's something alien or feels paranormal or supernatural in their midst. They know that there's something there. This isn't just an idea they have, but there's the real, very real presence of God himself in their midst. They, they, Jesus has been unlocked to them, and they can understand him, and they're motivated by his presence. Okay, and this leads to the apostles being so excited about who Jesus is that they are performing miracles, and they're doing signs and wonders, and people are witnessing this. Can you guys see this? And so, that, so, so these two things lead to verse 44. All the believers were together 
and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to, and gave to everyone who had need. And we've seen this a lot in our world. Sometimes like communism kind of looks like this. Even some of these weird cults kind of copy this. But I don't think that's exactly what's going on. And I'm not necessarily saying we should all sell our houses and we'll renovate the basement. And we'll have showers and kitchens and we all are going to live in the basement of ABC. I'm not necessarily saying that. But what is going on here? There's this intense fueling going on in this church. The result is that they, they want to spend even more time together because then when they're together, they connect with Jesus. They, they recognize Jesus when they're together with each other. And they start to blur the lines between property and possessions. They start to view everything as being shared because this belief is so strong in Jesus' sacrifice that they start to sacrifice their lives in a way that's uncommon in their world. Can you guys see that? They, that they'll, they'll give up their wants and their luxuries for the needs of others. And all of this ends up leading to verse 46 and 47. Check this out. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts, and they broke bread in their homes, and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Um, yeah, I think so. I think it was, but I think communion looks different than our communion. They had a meal together, but they're every day they're meeting together and they're breaking bread and they're sharing. And there's people who probably don't have a lot and they're coming, and the, the people who are rich are providing the food. So yeah, I think that's what's going on. And, and I want us to see that 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 they're so excited to be together that there's this thankfulness, there's this joy, there's this positivity, there's this generous generous heart, there's a graciousness in these people that they love being together and they love being in community. It's this positive vibes that are flowing out of this church. And this leads to all these outsiders on the outside who have broken lives and broken marriages and broken, broken structural social systems are looking at these people who seem to all just be obsessed with each other and they can't get enough of each other. And this leads to God opening their hearts, and there's this crazy desire for people to join, and they love this positive energy that's going on, that's fueling this community, and they want to be a part of it. That's, I think, what's going on in our crime scene. If we looked at it and we pushed the pause button, this is what's going on. This is the flow that's going on. Can you guys see that? And so... All of this energy is pulsing in this. This is a beautiful community. This is a kind of church that we would want to be a part of. But what are the clues that are inside of this passage as we study it now together? There's some clues in this passage, if we're detectives, that we can see. And there's also some clues outside of the passage. How does a church become like this? I think the first clue, it's not in the passage, but it's a little before it. If you have your Bible, it Acts 2. Verse 36 and 37. There's this sense of forgiveness that the people were convicted and, and they, they felt this need for, to be forgiven by God. But when they received that forgiveness, it created inside of them the sense of desire to love other people uh, because they've been forgiven. There's a sense of joy that I want to give you my life and I want to share my life with you because I'm so happy about what God has done in me. But inside of the verses, I want to go back to those couple words and look at the clues there. The first one is in, in 42. We talked about this word, this word about devoted. In the Greek, how this is talking about intentionality, the determination to not lose what Jesus had, lost, had given them. I want you guys to just picture, if you say you guys were a disciple, in the Gospels, Jesus is cruising around with you for three years. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that isn't being mentioned behind the scenes, underneath, between the lines. What would it have been like to live with Jesus, to walk with Jesus, to eat meals with Jesus, to maybe sleep beside Jesus in a tent or whatever, and do this day in, day out for three years? Have you guys ever thought about what that would be like to walk and live among Jesus? So what we see going on in this passage is the disciples, they really want to preserve not just the teachings of Jesus, but the entire lifestyle of Jesus. Have you guys ever thought about that? They're not trying to reinvent the wheel. They see something about the way he lived, 
the way he shared meals, the way they all had a common purse, they all put all their money together, they did this stuff, and they're seeing, if we lose this, we might lose what it means to be a follower of Jesus. It's not just his teachings, it's the community he created. And so if you, if you look at the four things in verse 42, those are all things that Jesus did and taught the disciples were important for their lives too. These are, so the, the, we see that these people are committed to the way of Jesus. It's not optional. It literally means if I'm a follower of Jesus, I follow the way of Jesus. These four things are in my life, and that's what it means to be a Christian. In our walk with God, do we view those four things as essential to being a follower of Jesus, or do we think that they're optional? Because the disciples are terrified. If we lose this way of life, this whole movement of God could disappear. Okay, then I think the next clue, we talked about this fear. As detectives, we can look at this and we can think about this clue of this fear of God, this awe of God, this wonder of God. Where does that come from? Where does the wonder of God come from in a community? If, if ABC has the wonder of God, what would that look like in our church? What do you guys think? People be drawn to that, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, like churches around the world, Iran is deeply under persecution, but there's a wonder of the forgiveness of God that these, these Muslims are saying, I've been forgiven by a God who loves me with all my heart, and there's this wonder of God's power in their life that's flooding in, and it's creating this attraction to the people around them that they're saying, I can't find this in my world, there's something uniquely happening which seems supernatural, it seems paranormal, and there's this wonder that draws people like flies to the light. Okay, so where, where, does, this, where does this awe come from? This wonder, the sense of excitement, where does it come from? If we're, if we're looking at this like we're the CSI people, we got the white coats on and the, the glasses, and we're, we're looking around and we got the fingerprints, you know, and the dust, and where is, where is this coming from, this sense of excitement and this wonder? Can you guys see it in the passage? Yeah. So there's something crazy going on, right? They, they, they have this ability in the Lord to be able to do things that excite the world, and it shows that Jesus is real. But how did the disciples get to the place where this mindset was there? Okay, so CSI, right? In the TV show, you're, um, you got the clues, but not all the clues sometimes answer the question. Sometimes you get what's called a lead. What's a lead? Right. And so if you have a lead, you're probably going to call somebody or there's a, something I'm going to investigate and it, it's, it's like a cause and effect and I'm gonna, it's going to take me outside of the actual crime scene and help me to understand what's going on here in this little crime scene, but how the outside world is probably affecting this. Are there any leads that we can get to if we look at this passage? Yeah, yeah, so Pentecost happened. Jesus promised, like Rose is saying, Jesus promised that this is going to be happening. Uh, what about the understanding of how the community functions? Okay, sorry, I'm, I'm, I already know where the leads are, so it's, it's, it's kind of a fabricated um, thing where we're doing here, but I'm kind of like leading you guys on where I want you guys to go with this. Um, it, okay, so they really revered Jesus' words, and Jesus predicted that these things would happen. And so when these things are starting to happen, I think that they recognize something powerful is happening. Did Jesus ever talk about this stuff before? Okay, so let's, let's, here, let's go to John chapter 13, verse 35. I want to show you two passages and explain, I kind of think, what's going on here, and I think this is unmistakable. Um, John 13, verse 35 says... 34 says, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Right? And so all these people on the outside are starting to look in and recognize that there's this crazy love going on that's not natural. 
It's a sacrificial type of life going on, and Jesus predicted that this was going to happen. Right? And so in John, Jesus says, he showed, he showed them the full extent of his love. Before this, Jesus took out his outer garments. This is the king of the universe, and he took out... He, he got into his work gear and he washed their stinky feet in front of all of them. And they said, no, don't wash my feet. And Jesus is saying, don't try to stop me from becoming the least among all of you. Don't try to stop me from becoming all of your slaves because I love you. That's my heart for you. I will give up everything for you so that you will give up everything for each other. And so maybe a clue that we see is that a unity seems to flow out of costly sacrifice. I want you guys to think about that. When I sacrifice for somebody else, it creates loyalty and affection. When Jesus lays down his life for his sheep, he says, I'm not a victim. I'm willingly laying my life down because I want to protect you because I'm your shepherd. Do you think that does something in the hearts of those people when they see Jesus dying for them and laying this all down, not as a victim, but someone who's doing that to shield them and to protect them? Do you think it does something in their heart to want to unify and protect and live their lives for each other. Is this, is this a piece of data that's helpful to us to understand how these communities form? Okay, I don't know if you guys are convinced with that evidence, but I want to look at John 17. I think John 17, verse 20 to 23, is almost bang on exact word-for-word word understanding of what's going on in Acts, that Jesus promised these things to happen, and now they're seeing it. And I want to kind of explain what Jesus is saying, how he thinks this is going to work. This is the linchpin. This is the key, I think, the key piece of evidence that we need to understand what's going on in Acts. This is what Jesus says. My prayer is not just for the disciples. I pray for also everybody else who will believe in me through the message that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that you may be one, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and that you have loved them even as you have loved me. Can you guys see in that passage how this is connected with the passage in Acts? There's a sense of complete unity and indistinguishability that I, I can't see where I stop and where you begin, and I love you so much that everything that I have is yours. And everything that you have is mine, not because we want to be communists and start a cult, but because that's how God the Father and how Jesus the Son live. That's the ultimate reality, and we have to enter into that with God. This is what John 17, 21 is teaching. The early church is imitating God the Father and Jesus the Son. Can you guys see that? And when the church manifests unity, the world is attracted to it. And that's what's going on in these verses, that, that there's, this, there's this type of unity and there's this self-sacrifice that comes out of truth that the world cannot produce. The world cannot manufacture this. Only God can when we see God and his self sacrifice of himself for his son and Jesus' self-sacrifice for his father. When we see that and we understand that, it automatically moves our heart to want to do the same. We want to imitate our father. And the result of this is this intense joy and there's this graciousness like God, uh, like God must be experiencing every moment of his life. We have this intense joy and gratefulness that I want to be in your presence. I want to be with you because I love my Father, and that's how the Father and the Son love. And when I see you, I see something in you that is beautiful. I see something in you that points back to God, and I love that. That's what's going on in this church. God has so affected their hearts that now they love the way that God the Father loves his Son. Okay, so I think that this is what's going on, but I want to I wanna ask the question here, and then I want to tell you guys a kind of a funny story. The first thing I want to ask, though, this and this, I want you to think about this with me. Where does unity come from? Does unity come first in the church, or does truth? Have you guys ever thought about this before? Which is more important for a church, to be, to be God-fueled 
Think about it. Do do humans ever decide to live in unity and peace without a strong common goal first? Can we can we create a powerful love and commitment to each other without a world-shattering truth inspiring us and bringing together? In our world, do we ever see people in society sacrificing their time and their money and their cause if they haven't had a big desire in their heart that first has led them to bind together and to form something together? Do you guys ever see that? I want to just quickly explain here uh, what's going on in John. I want to go deeper here. John 17, in its context, what Jesus is saying, I want to just quickly summarize all the verses before Jesus gets to the unity passage to understand how truth and unity work together. And if truth gets first, it creates undeniable automatic unity. This is what Jesus is saying. John John 17, verses 1 to 3, Jesus asks his Father to glorify him by making him have the same rank as his Father. He's saying that he's revealed the world. He's done his job. He's revealed the truth to the world, and he's drawn everybody to himself. He's created this powerful devotion in these disciples. And then Jesus asks the Father to protect them. This is the next couple verses. To protect them because they will not be able any longer. He he won't be able to shield them any longer in this world personally. But Jesus is saying, I've set them apart from the world to be holy, to be rescued from the darkness. Can you see that? This this truth, Jesus in his truth is pulling people out of the world and making them his own. He is creating the community. And the next verses say that the world will hate the disciples the way that they hated Jesus. He, this is what Jesus says. And so he asks, Jesus, asks his father to continue to separate them even more from the, by the truth and to persevere them and to make them faithful so that they will be just like he is. So the truth is what's pulling people out of the world and it automatically is creating this community. And look at verse 17 and 19 if you have your Bible. Jesus begs his father, set them apart by the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, I've sent them into the world. I set myself apart by, my, by the truth that I live in, by the reality I live in. I set myself apart so that they will be set apart. ABC, can you see what's going on? If God pulls us into the truth about who we are, the truth about God, about Jesus, that automatically creates a unity with each other because we have been changed and pulled out of the world by him. That's what leads to unity. And right after that is where Jesus says, this unity will flow out of the truth about your identity of who I've created you to be. I have pulled you together. I am the one who keeps you together. So unity doesn't happen first in the church. If a church desires unity first before truth, it'll never get that. But if a church pursues Jesus with white hot love, and if the truth of Jesus pulls us away from the world and into him, unity will come automatically. That's what Jesus teaches. Okay, so how do we make sense of all of this data? If, if, did anybody play the board game Clue? Maybe you didn't play CSI. Anybody played board game Clue? Okay, so who killed Mr. Body with what weapon in which room? Right, we're putting this all together now. We want to create a, create a conclusion. What is going on here? I'm going to tell you a funny story here. It's, it's running out of time. Time's up against me. I, I think what's going on here in, in verse 37 and 38 before our passage is that Jesus creates this holy conviction like he's talking about in this prayer. And he's, he's pulling people by revealing himself. He shows people their darkness. And in that light and the forgiveness, he pulls them into his life. And in that, unity starts. Jesus' holy presence creates conviction in our conscience, and we should never run away from it. So I want to say something practical here. We should never run away from the real Jesus when he pierces us with his eyes of fire. When he searches deep into the ugliness of our sinful heart, Jesus' eyes are all seeing, they're all holy, but they're also loving. And so when Jesus looks into our eyes and he can see right into our soul, it it pierces us. Sometimes we get afraid by that, but that is love. And Jesus is calling us into a deeper walk with him. When we read the Bible, when we pray, when we hear a sermon preached and we feel that guilt, Jesus is telling us not to run away like Adam and Eve. That's how Jesus loves us. He's calling us. He's correcting us. He's restoring us. 
And he's saying, don't ever run away from my spirit. When you feel that guilt, don't think I'm not, I'm, I, I still accept you, I love you, and I'm my shining my light on you to pull you into the light to heal you. Don't ever run away from conviction. Conviction from the Holy Spirit is what God does when he loves us to change us and transform us. Okay, here's the funny story. Oh man, this is, okay. I had a friend, in, in, he was my roommate in Bible college, right? And so he would play drop in basketball at like 9.30 p.m. to like 11 p.m. And he would come back to the dorm and he was like just dripping sweat. Like just dripping. I mean, it was crazy. And then he would sit down in his cloth fabric computer chair and he would start typing up an essay. And then at like 1 p.m. he would just be like so burnt out. He'd be like, oh. And then he would collapse into his mattress, into the blankets and the pillows in his sweat and he would sleep and this went on for quite a while until eventually I was getting annoyed with the way that our room smelled and I said to him you know um, when you finish play basketball you should maybe come here let your body temperature cool down a bit take a shower get changed and then just continue on with life like you don't have to skip a bunch of steps here it's really unhygienic and I remember him looking at me, and he was like, no, no, this it's a little different. He's like, there's something different about me. My sweat doesn't stink. <laughs> and I, 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 I just, I would never, if he wanted to, I would never switch beds with him for a couple weeks. Like, it was revolting. And I guess to him, his sweat didn't stink. But I want us to understand that that the primary thing in our text, the primary thing that fuels a community of God is the desire to be forgiven. Receiving forgiveness from God requires us believing that we need to be forgiven. And when I receive that forgiveness for my rebellion with a soft heart, I'm healed. And when this heart is changed and I am softened, it creates something inside of me. It creates an acceptance of you, and it creates acceptance of me that we love each other because that's how God feels about us. Not because I'm actually good and my sweat doesn't stink. It's because God loves me. This is called godly sorrow when my heart feels powerfully guilty and I mourn over it. This isn't something we should hide from. This is something that leads to God's forgiveness and when I receive grace as grace. And so I, the love of Jesus my rescuer it leads to, my, to it leads me into being part of the rescued, the reconciled, the redeemed. And then I love you and accept you as you are, not because of who you are, but who Jesus sees you to be. Because guess what? I've been here for, I don't know, is it almost two and a half years, three years? I know some of you pretty well. Okay, I know some of you pretty well. And for the little bits that I can see of you, I see amazing things and I also see sin because I'm a human being and I can see that, I can discern that. But I can see just a little fraction of your life. But if I look into my heart, I can see way more. And let me tell you, from where I'm standing, I am the worst person in this room. My sweat stinks. <laughs> I deserve punishment. I deserve to be destroyed by God for my rebellion to him and the ugliness of my sin. My sweat stinks. But when I'm in the presence of my holy Jesus and I see his love and his purity and his magnificence and I see my own wickedness, my own kindness, my arrogance and my selfishness and he says, I'm not like that, but I still love you. Become like me. And when Jesus offers me that type of love and forgiveness, I become so, so grateful and joyful and thankful. And that's what's going on in verse 46. These people love each other so much because they've been forgiven. And because of that, they look at each other. They don't see the warts. They look at each other and they love each other with all of their being. I can't hug Jesus, but I can hug you. I can't sacrifice and give things up to Jesus, but I can pour my life out for you. This is what's going on in Acts 2, verse 42 to 47. That love flows of the truth of being forgiven and being held by the good arms of Jesus himself. Truth leads to unity, and that unity in acceptance of other people leads to the world seeing an impossible love, and that leads the lost to being attracted to Jesus. And so here's a, here's a couple application things that I want us to, to look at, and I just want to conclude it. 
in my own personal quiet time? Am I, am I meeting the real Jesus of the Bible, the Jesus with the eyes of fire who looks at John in Revelation and loves him and makes him stand up and he, he, he consoles him? Or do I meet the Jesus of my imagination that I've constructed who doesn't care and he's just the same as me? Do I spend time alone with Jesus and Jesus teaches me that he forgives me and he has grace on me so I should love you with that same love that he loves me? Are you guys doing that? Here's the next thing. With our families, we love families at ABC. Are we training our kids literally in the way of Jesus? Are we literally shaping our homes after verse 42? Like literally, this is what it literally means to be a follower of Jesus, is to live the life he lived. It says that in 1 John. If we say that we abide in him, we have to live the life Jesus lived. As parents, are we doing verse 42 with our kids? Are we reading and learning the apostles and Jesus' teaching together? Are we playing together, investing in each other's hearts, spending time with each other because we love each other, not because we're trying to mold and shape them? When we eat meals together, are we reminded of Jesus? And do we, we have supper thinking about how Jesus had supper with his disciples and that he's there in the room with us and he's leading the conversation as we're having supper? Do we think that way? Do we pray to God, our Father, as a family, the way Jesus did? Do we, do, are we modeling our life that looks the way that Jesus did when he walked this earth with our kids? Here's another one. Friends at ABC, do we have Christian friends at this church? Are you guys friends with each other? You got some friendships here? Yeah? Do, when we hang out with each other, do we talk about every single thing except for Jesus? Does Jesus come up in our conversations with each other? If he's not, there's something seriously wrong because Jesus is the thing that has brought us together. He's the truth that has unified us. I want to share with you that I'm a mess and that Jesus is forgiving me and Jesus is changing me. I want to tell you about the sins in my life and how Jesus is replacing them with awesome stuff instead. I want to do that because I want to give glory to Jesus, that Jesus is amazing. And I want you to experience that too. And I want you to tell me about the areas of your life where you're growing in ways that I can only imagine. Here's the last one, small groups. Do we believe Jesus is not giving us the freedom to shape our small groups at this church the way we want, but he's asking us to model them after these verses? Do we believe that this is just a historical thing that happened? Or is this the way of Christ? Do our small groups have these kind of things in them? And so Jesus is calling us. He's inviting us. He's inspiring us into this. That this is available to us too. And I want to just say thank you, you guys, to ABC. I want to say thank you to you that I'm seeing you guys do this. I'm seeing me do this. On Wednesday, we had a small group at our house, and we met. We had supper together, and we were talking about the grace of Jesus Christ how Jesus loves the world, and God has already made a decision about our world before there was a world. God had already forgiven the world in Christ through Jesus before there was a world. That's how much God loves this world. God hasn't changed his mind about us when we ask for forgiveness. He already feels these ways, this way about us. He loves us. And we were talking about this grace, and I could see as we were talking about this grace that our small group, we were falling in love with each other. There was this sense of unity. I remember Mike was talking, and I put my hand on his leg, and I was just like, thank you for sharing that. Like, there was a sense of like being pulled and drawn together. Where we were, I feel like we're starting to sacrifice our life for one another. This is happening at ABC. I just want to let you know this is happening. I'm seeing this in our small groups. I hear reports about this. Jesus is in our midst, and Jesus is starting to do these things. But it only happens when we accept his grace as grace. If we want this church to die, the first thing that we should do is start telling people, start telling ourselves that we haven't been forgiven, we don't need to be forgiven because God just loves everybody as they are and that we don't need God's grace. It's only when we start to recognize our need for Christ that, that the sense of gratefulness floods in and it changes my whole perspective. So that's enough talking on my end. How do you guys answer this? How does receiving grace as grace create the love which leads to unity and power? And I put there Luke 7, 47. That's a beautiful thing. Jesus says in Luke 7, 47, those who have been forgiven much, love much. 
What do you guys think? How do we answer this question? 